Sandy, welcome back to welcome back to Essex. Thanks. Then we have Professor Kefa Slamina, who is Professor of Law and Nelson Mandela's School of Law at the University of Fort Hare. He's also an advocate of the High Court of Zambia and member of the Committee on the Rights of the Child. Professor Lumina, um, happy to, to welcome you back to Essex. Thank you very much. Delighted and, to be back. Thank you. Uh, and next we have Ignacio Sez, who is uh, the Executive Director of the Center for Economic and Social Rights. You're beginning to see a pattern in terms of a focus on, on economic, social, and cultural rights, which obviously very, we're very pleased to see. Ignacio, welcome. Welcome back to Essex, albeit in this rather strange virtual virtual form. Thank you, Andrew. Great to be here. And last but not least, we have Dr. Mag Magdalena Sepulveda, who is the executive, executive director of the Global Initiative for Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and a senior research associate at the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development. Uh, Magdalena, welcome back to welcome back to Essex. Thank you, my pleasure. So I'm just going to just going to make a few uh, introductory comments, and then I'm going to, to pass over the the task of, of, of chairing effectively this afternoon's um, final panel discussion to my colleague uh, Jude Bueno de Mesquita. Um, I'm going to start with a question, and the question is: Can you remember where you first were? Those of you who who are alumni, or those of you who are familiar with this term, where you first were, or who it first was that used the term Essex Mafia. <laughs> Essex Mafia has become a, a become a kind of a term of art, in effect, to refer to that remarkable community of now approaching 3,000, 3,000, astonishing uh, number of people, 3,000 former uh, alumni, graduates of the Essex Human Rights Programme, spanning the undergraduate degrees, uh, the LLMs, the MAs, uh, and of course, P the PhD programme as well. Uh, the Essex Mafia has gone on to exert a profound influence upon the development of human rights, both in academia, we have spawned in effect many of our own competitors and, and rivals. It always bemuses me to see um, some of the programs, human rights programs uh, out there, which bear a strong resemblance to Essex and obviously massively encourage the, 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 the diffusion of, of human rights education across the world. So we take that as a great, as a great honor in effect. And of course, just as importantly, the, way, the, the ways in which our graduates have gone on to fundamentally influence the development of the, the broader international human rights project, uh, encompassing both law and of course, more multidisciplinary perspectives and the like. Um, just by way of answering my own question, uh, it was Kevin Boyle, funnily enough, my, my, my former, um, my predecessor, much missed, uh, creator, effectively, one of the, the, the founding fathers, founding parents of the, of the Human Rights Center way back in 1982-83. Um, Kevin Boyle was the first person who used that term, um, uh, the, 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 the mafia. Kevin was always slightly uncomfortable with it, to be, to be honest with you, uh, and he preferred the, the phrase family, the Essex family, as opposed to the Essex, ma Essex mafia. I, I prefer mafia. I think, <laughs> I think the, the community of, of former graduates have worked much more effectively and, and along the lines of the mafia without obviously any of the dead bodies, of course. Um, so this, uh, thank you, Ian, absolutely. Rest in peace to, to Kevin. Um, so this afternoon's panel is, is really going to address the, the contributions, the roles required, of course, of, of, of human rights professionals in the, the wider world at this particular moment in time where the Human Rights Project is, is encountering various challenges. Uh, let's, let's face it, it's encountering challenges in some parts of the world where it has always encountered challenges and increasingly also facing obstacles in parts of the world where it was widely assumed. I have to say, I've, I long felt wrongly widely assumed, but widely assumed that human rights were safe and secure within liberal democracies, for example. So our, our panelists this, this afternoon are going to address the particular roles that they, the contributions that they have made uh, to the Human Rights Project, continue to make to the Human Rights Project. And I hope we'll be able to say lots of positive things about the, the continuing influence and, and legacy of the education that they, they received at, at Essex. Many of you, I'm sure, are, are established human rights. Um, many of you in the, on the audience are established human rights professionals, members of the Essex Mafia, perhaps. But also, I assume there will be many students who are thinking, um, anxiously, perhaps in some cases, about their, their prospective careers. 
I'm sure um, our, our panelists will be will be happy and welcome to address some of those concerns and to address uh, to, to provide support and encouragement to all of you, uh, all of us who are part of this incredibly valuable and incredibly important community. So I'm going to, to say nothing more. I'm going to switch off my camera, go mute, to, uh, uh, and, and pass over the floor to, to my colleague, uh, Giudwano de Mosquita. Once again, welcome to Essex, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, I'm going to say a few words at the end, but I know you're now dying to hear our wonderful speakers. So I will just introduce them very briefly in turn in terms of introducing the title of their talk and then I will disappear from your screen while they speak and then pop up again. So um, first of all, we're going to we're going to have a presentation from Professor Sandy Liebenberg and Sandy has chosen to speak on the topic of reconnecting socio-economic rights to their transformative potential. Thank you and over to you Sandy. Thanks Jude and um, hi everyone, all the participants. It's really delightful to be back at Essex, um, it, albeit in the virtual realm. Um, as Jude's mentioned, I've chosen to speak on reconnecting socioeconomic rights to their transformative potential. And I chose this topic really reflecting on what a profound shock the coronavirus pandemic this year has been to our economic, social and cultural systems and reflecting on the intertwined crises of climate change and environmental destruction, along with this burgeoning chasm of wealth and income between rich and poor, and really thinking, well, how effective have human rights in general and economic and social rights in particular been in responding to these multiple crises that we faced with. And my impression has really been that the human rights discourse has been pretty marginal in the current crisis that we faced this year. There's been very little acknowledgement from governments that the ability of public health systems to respond to the global pandemic has been severely impeded by the erosion of public health systems and social protection systems in the wake of the global financial crisis of 2007 to 2009. And of course, in, in my region of the world, in Africa, the long legacy of structural adjustment programs. And of course, we know the huge economic devastation that the pandemic and containment measures have imposed on people's lives and livelihoods. In the context of civil and political rights in a report released yesterday, Civicus Monitor report that they estimate that 87% of the world's population now lives in countries that are regarded as closed, repressed or obstructed. And this is a 4% increase on previous years. In fact, there are many examples cited of how the COVID pandemic has been used as a pretext to restrict civil and political liberties beyond a proportionate response to the public health crisis. So in this context, what I've been grappling with is that how can economic, social and cultural rights be reimagined and reconnected to their transformative potential. And in this, these brief remarks, I want to suggest that one of the important insights that the coronavirus pandemic has illuminated and that can help point the way to a revitalization of economic, social and cultural rights is the multiple layers of interdependence that it has surfaced. <laughs> 
Now, of course, interdependence is, is a very well-known theme to human rights um, education. And I very well remember in 1993, really dating myself, of course, doing my master's degree um, at Essex and learning the mantra of the interdependence, indivisibility, interrelatedness of human rights. But how can we draw on this concept and also extend and deepen it to enable economic and social rights to play a more transformative role in the current context? And I want to suggest uh, four levels of interdependence that the pandemic has demonstrated. The first one is the well-known one of the interdependence between civil and political rights on the one hand and economic, social and cultural rights on the other. As mentioned, this is the most well-known context of interdependence that human rights law is familiar with. And it's been very helpful to challenge in challenging the marginalization of ESC rights um, in the context of international human rights law, but also national legal and constitutional systems. The basic insight of this form of interdependence is that it highlights this notion of a holistic picture of what it means to be a human being and to thrive in contemporary society and how interdependent the political, the economic, the social, the cultural, the psychological dimensions of our lives are. So that in effect, it's impossible to protect human beings effectively by only focusing on one dimension and neglecting the intersections with other dimensions. And I think the pandemic has really highlighted this dimension very um, clearly. So, for example, in his report earlier this year, the UN Secretary General pointed out that never before, and I quote, has the importance of the responsibility of governments to protect people by guaranteeing their economic, social and cultural rights been so clearly demonstrated. And there's an important lesson to learn when this is over. Countries that have invested in protecting economic and social rights are likely to be more resilient. Universal healthcare systems strengthen a country's ability to contain a threat to public health, but so do effective food distribution systems, social security and protection systems, gender equality, protecting people and jobs through labor rights, minimum wages and paid sick leave, as well as health and safety in workplace standards. At the same time, civil and political rights and enabling rights such as access to information have played a critical role in preserving democratic space and promoting the accountability of governments and powerful private actors um, in, in promoting citizen trust and the legitimacy of coronavirus containment measures. As the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet said, um, Combating the pandemic may require us to be open and transparent and involve people in the decisions that affect them. Securing compliance depends on building trust and trust depends on building transparency and participation. So the lesson to be learnt, I would suggest for human rights education and advocacy is that even if we focus on one or the other group of rights, we should always be careful to assert a holistic vision of human rights and pay attention to the intersections between different groups of rights. <laughs>
The second sphere of interdependence that I want to highlight is the interdependence between social reproduction and economic reproduction. So as the pandemic and the lockdown measures have forced economic activity for those lucky enough in the middle classes um, to be able to work from home, um, it's really highlighted the dependence of the economic system of the work of social reproduction and um, predominantly performed by women in the intimacy of their homes and um, to the formal sphere of the economy. So the work of caring for young children, of cooking, of caring for elderly or disabled relatives, and these interconnections have really been brought home to us as the pandemic, if you excuse the pun, has literally come into our homes. It's also demonstrated how dependent we are on the frontline workers, often poorly paid with minimal benefits, often work done by groups systemically discriminated against, such as low income communities, people of color, migrant workers, and in the frontline work deemed essential services of healthcare, food production and distribution and delivery services. So the question that this form of interdependence and the challenge that it raises for us is really how can we reimagine alternative economic systems that properly value and acknowledge these kinds of work that have traditionally been invisible or poorly valued in the home, the reproductive caring work, as well as the poorly paid precarious work that has been done in the gig economy, as well as the informal sector of many countries. The third dimension that I want to highlight of interdependence that I believe the pandemic has shown is the interdependence between humanity and the natural world. As the high level political forum on sustainable development noted, there is a large and growing body of evidence showing the emerging, uh, the rate of emerging zoonotic infections and infectious diseases have been accelerating over the past decades due to human activities such as deforestation, the expansion of intensive agriculture, increased harvesting, trading and consumption of wildlife and close Close contact between humans and wild and domestic animals. And of course, the climate crisis brings home to us the profound implications for all human rights and including the fundamental human rights of survival on this planet. So there are many exciting developments in the human rights sphere. Many of the UN treaty bodies are increasingly incorporating environmental considerations in their review of state reports, their statements, their general comments. You have a special procedure of the Human Rights Council on a healthy environment. And you also have increased advocacy by NGOs for the recognition by the Human Rights Council of a right to a safe, healthy and sustainable human, uh, human environment or natural environment. So these developments should be intensified as they make human rights more responsive to this interdependence between human and planetary well-being. The fourth and final dimension of interdependence that I believe the pandemic has shown us is of global interdependence. The notion that we live in a globalized world where the fates and fortunes of all are closely intertwined. 
as Antonio Guterres has rightly remarked, if one country fails in its efforts to control the spread of the virus, all countries are at risk. The world is only as strong as the weakest healthcare system. So global solidarity and international cooperation are going to be key to an effective public health response to the, the pandemic, as well as to a sustainable and just economic recovery. And in two statements, which the committee that I've been privileged to sit on these past four years, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights has released this year, the notion of international assistance and cooperation in the context of the pandemic has been highlighted, particularly in the spheres of debt relief and economic recovery, and most recently in its statement on a coronavirus vaccine, um, where the committee cautioned and warned against vaccine isolationism or a race for COVID vaccines among states, including the striking of non-transparent deals with private pharmaceutical and development countries to secure vaccines preferentially for all or most of their own populations. It warned that such strategies would ultimately be counterproductive, leading to price increases for vaccines, the creation of monopolies, the obstruction of access to vaccines by the world's poorest countries, and ultimately the risk of repeated upsurges. So in conclusion, we live in a time, as Andrew has said, that is precarious, where multilateralism and human rights are in decline. And I believe that the insights of interdependence, especially if we center them in human rights advocacy and education, can help revitalize the human rights discourse. It can also connect us to new global movements um, that have captured the world's imagination, such as Me Too, Black Lives Matter, the youth climate justice movements, and the movements for economic justice and political justice in the global south. In this way, human rights advocacy and education can reconnect to their origins in organization and mobilization to transform societies in line with the core human rights values of human dignity, equality, and freedom. Thanks, Judes. Thank you so much, Sandy. I think um, your remarks were incredibly insightful. Um, and you know, one thing I would really draw from that is how um, the global crisis um, with, with coronavirus, both the health crisis and the socioeconomic crisis has, has really sort of forced us to re-examine um, the practice of, of human rights um, and force us to really try and get to grips with some of the different areas where we need to refocus our attention. Um, so that's also a nice segue into uh, the presentation of our next speaker, which is um, Ignacio Saez, Executive Director of the Centre for Economic and Social Rights. Um, and Ignacio is speaking on the topic of From Symptoms to Systems Towards a Rights-Based Economy. Over to you, Ignacio. Thank you so much, Jude. Um... And thank you, Sandy, for that really inspiring uh, presentation. I, I love the four levels of interdependence. And um, what I'm going to say is going to be very resonant, uh, not surprisingly, perhaps, with, with uh, Sandy's analysis. I hope it, it is not uh, duplicative and that we can um, each presentation will build on the other. My aim is to argue that um, we need a more systemic human rights practice that articulates and advances a more propositional vision of what the economy is for. And I'm gonna start with a very quick assessment of how far we've come as a human rights movement or ESC rights movement in engaging with questions of economic injustice, particularly in the decade since the global financial crisis. Um, then I will reflect uh, briefly on the key challenges that the current pandemic 
context poses for us as ESC rights advocates, which I think uh, Sandy has beautifully laid out. Um, and then we'll move on to some pointers for future directions for economic and social rights practice for the decade to come. I will end uh, by illustrating how we at the Center for Economic and Social Rights, um, what we are doing to advance a vision of a rights-based economy. So to begin with, I think it's important to, to take stock of the significant progress that has been made by the human rights movement. And by that, I mean human rights activists, academics, and human rights institutions in engaging with different dimensions of economic injustice. In the decade or so since the global financial crisis of 2008, there have been some really important steps forward on the normative, methodological, and advocacy fronts. And I'll just touch briefly on them, on what these have included. Um, firstly, a tremendous amount of work, uh, which Sandy has been very connected to, clarifying the scope and content of specific economic and social rights obligations. Uh, particularly those that are critical for tackling some of the challenges of economic globalization, non-retrogression, maximum available resources, and the critical concept of extraterritorial obligations. But also over this period, there's been the creation of several new soft law instruments addressing how these and other human rights obligations apply to critical cross-cutting issues of economic policy or economic injustice. I'm thinking... Uh, the um, guiding principles on extreme poverty that Magdalena steered some years ago, uh, the guiding principles on foreign debt that CFAS uh, steered also some years ago, and the guiding principles more recently on economic reforms, uh, which CSR was uh, closely involved with, together with the uh, former independent expert on debt and human rights, Juan Pablo Bohoslavsky. Um, but there, what's exciting is that there's also been the development of a lot of methodological and practical tools to operationalize these norms and to assess economic policies from a human rights perspective, from the creation of indicator sets and indices like the Human Rights Measurement Initiative or the, the SURF Index, to more holistic assessment frameworks uh, such as human rights impact assessments uh, on a range of uh, economic policy issues, or uh, the OPERA framework that CSR has developed that some of you may be familiar with. Um, and I think over this period, another thing to highlight is the amount of increased advocacy by human rights activists aimed at securing progressive judgments, decisions, and recommendations, both from courts or from, from other human rights bodies, on critical economic and environmental justice issues. And I'm, I'm thinking one of, one of the high points for me over the last year is the Urgenda case um, in the Netherlands, which I think it, we're, we're just about to mark the first anniversary of that or the work um, that we were part of together with the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, to, uh, which led to overturning austerity measures in Spain, for example. So, and it's also worth noting the growth of human rights advocacy in other forums that are not human rights forums. So before key international institutions that shape economic policy, the IMF, the, the World Bank, or development forums such as Financing for Development, these are all critical spaces in which human rights activists have brought human rights arguments to bear on issues from austerity and debt to, to tax and trade. But despite these advances, we have to acknowledge that we've made very limited inroads in leveraging human rights to shift the profoundly regressive economic policy trends and practices of the last decade, which, which Sandy has alluded to. And the fact is that over this same period, most governments and international institutions have entrenched neoliberal socioeconomic policies, which openly fly in the face of government's human rights commitments. Austerity measures over the last decade have slashed investment in public services and slashed or reduced social safety nets. Corporations have been able to increase their grip on the political decision-making process in many countries. Public goods from housing to healthcare have been increasingly commodified and privatization has encroached on more and more areas of public service delivery. Workers' rights have been increasingly eroded with unions in decline, wages stagnating, and the informal and gig economies swelling. So it's this web of trends that accounts for why we have the highest level of economic inequality in recent history. So while we should rightly be proud of the progress we've made in developing human rights standards and tools to address economic injustice issues, we must also acknowledge that these have had limited traction in practice in halting the entrenchment of these neoliberal policy trends over the last decade. 
human rights efforts, as, as Sandy so well says, they've, they've largely remained marginal to these broader policy processes, at best addressing the downstream impact, impacts of specific policies in isolated contexts. Now, the economic crisis brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic is a huge wake-up call for us in that regard. It's laid bare the lethal consequences of these regressive policy trends of the last decades, from weakened health systems to threadbare social protection schemes. And it's illuminated a bit like a dye, the, the, stru the structural inequities and inequalities that our economies sustain and reproduce. So it's now estimated that an additional 150 million people worldwide will have been pushed into extreme poverty, living on less than $1.90 a day by the end of this year, and that the number of people facing acute hunger will have doubled. And at the same time, the world's billionaires, including many of the, the tech giant uh, owners, are reported to have further increased their fortunes by more than a quarter over the last few months uh, to a record high of $10 trillion. Now, looking at the response of the human rights movement over the last nine months, and here I fully agree with Sandy, much of it has been on the many examples of state overreach, by which I mean the abuse of pandemic restrictions to curtail civil and political freedoms. And we've seen that in many, many countries. But there's been less attention to the equally grave risk of state underreach, by which I mean the chronic neglect of government's positive economic and social rights obligations that has compounded the impacts of the virus. Human rights are not only a set of restrictions on government action in response to the pandemic, they're also a set of prescriptions that should guide a just economic recovery. So at CSR, we believe that the moment poses a big challenge and a big opportunity to our community, that of prompting a fundamental rethink of the relationship between human rights and the economy. Around the globe, the economic crisis and the inadequacy of government's responses to it are leading more and more people to question the morality of an economic system, which for decades has placed the market at the center of all human interactions, measuring progress and development solely in terms of economic growth. But as we saw just after the global financial crisis, the strong gravitational pull towards business as usual means that the window of opportunity for advancing bold transformational ideas around economic alternatives is shrinking. While the pandemic continues to escalate in many countries, the balance is tilting further towards protecting the economy over protecting people. And at the international level, we're far from seeing the kind of global solidarity or progressive shifts that, that Sandy was alluding to was as being necessary. The IMF continues, for example, to prescribe fiscal consolidation and austerity on uh, countries uh, struggling to, to respond to the pandemic. So in this uncertain context and at this pivotal moment for the human rights movement and for humanity as a whole, I believe our practice must also pivot towards one that is more holistic, more systemic, more visionary, and more collaborative. Let me say two words on each thing. Different holistic, different parts of our movement have made valuable inroads in the analysis of deprivation of specific rights, health, education, food, resulting from specific policy trends or, or yeah, specific policy trends, austerity, debt, privatization. Now the pandemic has um, as Sandy so brilliantly said, you know, it's, it's surfaced so many multiple layers of inter interdependence. And the pandemic has challenged us to recognize the deep interconnectedness of these policy trends and to recognize their common underlying factors. So being more holistic, uh, a more holistic practice means harnessing the radically egalitarian and redistributive spirit of economic, social and cultural rights. It must have, as Sandy so beautifully says, the transformational potential of far-reaching norms like progressive realization, non-retrogression, substantive equality, that translate these into actionable policy demands. While we consolidated that normative framework for holding governments accountable to their positive economic and social rights obligations, that framework must now be much more fully activated uh, through a much greater demand for accountability, which requires more innovative strategies and approaches to building evidence of how government actions and inactions in the field of the economy breach their positive obligations. Um, 
and I completely concur that a holistic approach means avoiding the continued reification of two sets of rights. We are perhaps we ourselves as an organization called the Center for Economic and Social Rights are partly responsible for that. Uh, it's really vital that we inter integrate an indivisibility, indivisibility lens more fully in our work. Uh, we at CSR are talking much more about human rights uh, in socioeconomic policy or human rights in the economy as opposed to economic and social rights. Systemic, and I'll be brief on this. I believe it's time for the human rights movement to abandon its traditional agnosticism about economic systems and its reluctance to engage with structural causes of economic and social rights violations. Not addressing the structural roots of injustice is also a political stance. Um, and I say that because uh, avoiding being politically partisan was the reason why, for example, the, the, the committee um, some years ago um, you know, said that the ESC rights and the obligations of the covenant, uh, you know, uh, make no, uh, do not determine which kind of economic system is, is more human, human rights compliant than another. A systemic approach really entails interrogating and confronting the foundations of the prevailing economic model, which are antithetical to human rights. It means using a political economy analysis to understand what drives the configurations of power that have shaped and enabled the current model. Um, visionary, a more frontal critique of the flawed system, which has led to this state of affairs, will enable us to move beyond a denunciation of what we're against to articulate a more inspiring vision of what we're for. Um, holding governments accountable to their positive obligations entails delineating what we want to see as the role and characteristics of an effective state in delivering on human rights and the public interest. ESCR norms and principles, they give us the building blocks for setting out such a vision, but we need it to weave an accessible narrative around them. Um, something along the lines of economic and social rights affirm that certain material conditions are so essential for human dignity that they must be guaranteed to everyone. They demand action to redistribute resources, to remedy inequalities, and to rebalance power so that those material conditions can be guaranteed. And in that way, socioeconomic rights directly contest the logic of neoliberalism. They challenge its foundations and they disrupt its sustaining narratives. Now, I say that our practice must be collaborative because only by building collective counterpower in alliance with other civil society actors can we push for the economic transformation on the scale required to overcome the powerful vested interests that are stacked against us. Um, and cross-movement alliance building requires generating trust, being open to recognizing what we can learn from each other, but also recognizing the inherent limitations of our own discipline. Um, and it's exciting to see more participatory approaches to research and rights claiming that involve individuals and communities who are experiencing economic injustice in defining and deciding how to tackle the problems they face. So I wanted to just end, and I, I know, Jude, I'm, I'm running out of my time, but can I, can I ask Matthew just to put up the slide of, because um, I wanted to end by saying how um, it, it's all very well for, for somebody from CSR to pontificate on what the movement should do, but this is how, um, this is how the action that we're taking um, to envision a rights-based economy. We've made um, this envisioning a rights-based economy and catalyzing action around it. Uh, the goal of our new strategy for the next three years. In a report that we published uh, just a few weeks ago with Christian Aid, we've sketched out a very propositional vision um, and that looks at the values that should guide the economy, what it means to embed these values and the systemic shifts needed. Uh, Matthew, I'll ask you to pass on to the next. Um, this is what we mean by a rights-based economy, uh, one that guarantees the material, social and environmental conditions necessary for all people to live with dignity on a flourishing planet. Next. Can you move to the next? Oh. Oh, that's a very, oh, sorry, the values. Yeah, there's a strange fade. Um, we look at how the, the report looks at how human rights standards give flesh and force to values which are in the more, which have more popular currency, which, which people are um, citing and referring to. Uh, in, in common debates, or common debates, in, in, in popular debates and, and uh, uh, daily debates in every country around the economy, dignity, equ equity, et cetera. Um, next slide. But it also looks at some promising transform transformative policies 
uh, that are needed to embed human rights values in the economy. We look at issues of wealth taxation, universal basic income and other social protection schemes, minimum living wages, public services and public hands, debt cancellation and restructuring, and corporate regulation. Um, and next, but those transformative policies alone uh, are not gonna be enough to bring about a right, rights-based economy. To weave them together, we need some broader systemic shifts or seismic shifts in what we produce, distribute, consume, and value in our economies. Um, and there, for example, um, we, uh, we uh, talk about the, the importance of value and care uh, as, a, as, a, as a kind of fulcrum of, uh, and particularly unpaid care, as a, a fulcrum of our economies. So articulating a vision of a rights-based economy is not something that can be done by the human rights movement alone. This is an, an iterative uh, and collaborative process uh, and we're reaching out beyond the traditional human rights movement to engage with other progressive movements who've long been working for economic alternatives, um, including the labor movement, feminist, indigenous, environmental, and tax justice movements. So we're starting to see some uh, positive results of these efforts in terms of shifts in discourse and practice, and even in some governmental behavior. Argentina has just passed a wealth tax to finance uh, COVID responses. Um, and it, it's part of its rationale has been uh, uh, re has rested on human rights argumentation. But as I mentioned, the window of opportunity is closing um, and uh, there's such a mismatch between the scale of the challenges that we face and our capacity to confront them. I just wanted to end by acknowledging the wonderful work that Essex does in providing space for the kind of collaboration that I was stressing is so important, including collaboration within uh, within the economic and social rights community. You're such a fantastic bridge between academic and activist practice. Thank you and sorry for extending. Thank you so much, Ignacio. And I, I do have to tell everybody that I had the great privilege of being in the same class as Ignacio um, in 1999. And um, Ignacio always inspired me as a classmate and has continued to do so uh, in his ability to say incredibly profound um, things, in, but also in a very sort of accessible and non-intimidating way. Now, before I hand over to Professor Lumina, I would like to say to everybody that you are kind of in the Essex classroom. And as you know, in the Essex classroom, there's always a really good debate with good questions. And I see in our audience, we've got a number of our current students, we also have some of our past students um, who are real experts on economic and social rights. We've got Ian Byrne, we've got Rosella DeFalco, we've got Danilo Kirkic, um, we've got Luis Felipe Yanes. So please do um, post, your, post your questions for our fantastic panel because we'll have a bit of time at the end to discuss. Um, Ignacio, I found your presentation very powerful um, and we often rely on the centre's work, um, we, have, we, ha we have it on our, on our reading list because we find it a very accessible way, an effective way of um, helping students to understand some of the more academic debates in a, in a practical way. And I, I absolutely agree with you. I think we need to rethink how we approach the economy. Um, and I've just been reading Jason um, Hickel's new book on degrowth. And after many years of reading about human rights abuses and human rights literature, which, you know, it's quite, a lot of it is quite traumatic. Um, I've recently found myself being very traumatized by a book on, on the economy and the environment. And I think we need to really engage with some of this literature more. Um, and it becomes very difficult to, to be impartial in a sort of legal way um, when we read authors like, like Jason Hickel. Right, I'd like to now hand over um, to Professor Safas Lumina, who is a professor, visiting professor of constitutional and human rights law at the University of Lusaka. And uh, Professor Lumina's presentation leads on very well from Ignacio, who's focusing on the topic of uh, corruption and the realization of children and economic social, children's economic, social, and cultural rights. Professor Lumina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jude, and uh, thank you to Sandy and uh, Ignacio for your very insightful presentations. Um, when I was invited to speak on this panel, I planned to share some reflections on corruption and children's rights in general. But this morning I realized that I needed to align my remarks more closely with the theme of this panel, 
And so I plan to focus on procurement corruption and the realization of children's socioeconomic rights. And I think that this uh, approach is particularly relevant because of the increased attention that has uh, been paid to the issue of procurement corruption in the context of government responses to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, a problem that I think has very clear implications for the realization of children's rights. Now, it's, it's undoubted that uh, corruption has uh, a negative impact on the enjoyment of all, of all human rights. Uh, for one, it, it diverts funds that are necessary for the realization of human rights. And it also undermines the rule of law, as well as the functioning and legitimacy of state institutions. Uh, in addition, as target 16.5 of the SDGs uh, clearly demonstrates, uh, corruption may hamper efforts to achieve sustainable development. Uh, what I plan to, to do is the following. I'll first briefly discuss the uh, definition of corruption. I'll then talk about corruption in public procurement. Next, I'll highlight the impact of corruption on children's rights and uh, outline the approach of the Committee on the Rights of the Child. And I'll conclude with some thoughts on future directions for economic, social, and cultural rights education. Uh, there is no universally accepted definition of corruption as it is defined in different ways in various jurisdictions. But one, one can say is that corruption takes many forms that include bribery, extortion, nepotism, embezzlement, misappropriation, or other diversion of property trading in influence, abuse of functions, and illicit enrichment. And most of these acts are reflected in the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. But what is common to all of these acts is the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. Uh, corruption is often classified as grand or petty. Um, the former often involves large sums of money, and typically occurs at the very top levels in the public and private sectors, involving individuals that make the rules and policies and executive decisions. And the latter, which is also referred to as administrative corruption, refers to everyday abuse of interested power by low or mid-level officials in their daily interactions with ordinary citizens who are often trying to access essential public goods or services. Uh, corruption is particularly uh, evident in public procurement, and it is to this issue that I now turn. Every year, governments spend trillions of US dollars through the procurement process to purchase from the private sector goods and services that they require for the effective functioning and provision of public services, including those that support the realization of human rights. In this form of government spending, accounts for approximately 18 to 20% of gross domestic product in most countries. Nevertheless, a large amounts of money that are involved, the financial interests at stake, the complex complexity of the procurement process itself, the close interaction between public officials and the private sector, and the multitude of stakeholders, all make public procurement particularly susceptible to corruption. Uh, this type of corruption can be committed in various ways, and it can occur at any stage of the procurement process. And the, the four main forms of procurement corruption are eliminating or reducing competition, bias supplier selection, corrupt contract negotiation and management, and overpayment or forced payment for uh, services. As noted by the World Bank, the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in large-scale emergency spending by governments, sometimes uh, without the appropriate checks and balances. And this has exposed governments to a range of procurement risks, which include the following. First, corruption in the procurement of emergency supplies and services, in which context emergency supplies are purchased at grossly inflated prices, Contracts are awarded to politically co connected suppliers or shell companies that have been established for that purpose, or payments are made for contracts that are ne not performed or delivered on. Secondly, corruption in the supply chain and service delivery, uh, 
where goods and supplies are diverted by connected elites, defective goods are supplied or patients are constrained to pay bribes in return for treatment. And third, corruption in the administration of the response to the crisis, where salaries intended for additional healthcare workers are diverted or stolen and emergency jobs or new posts are filled by unqualified individuals as a result of nepotism or patronage. In South Africa, for example, and Sandy will be keenly aware of this, the introduction in March this year of relaxed emergency public procurement measures as part of the government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic has provided opportunities for corruption. According to the country's Auditor General, personal protective equipment has been supplied at grossly inflated prices and has often been of very poor quality. This includes masks that have been supplied to schools to enable children to return to school. The South African Police Service is currently investigating more than 600 companies that have been awarded PPE contracts that are valued in excess of 330 million US dollars. Now, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, in common with the other core treaties, does not explicitly mention corruption. Nevertheless, the committee realizes, as do all other treaty bodies, that corruption in all its forms has adverse impacts, both direct and indirect, on the realization of all human rights. In the general context of its work, uh, the committee has observed the harmful effect of corruption on the enjoyment of children's rights, and in particular on the availability, quality, and accessibility of child rights related services and goods. Um, for example, the right to education is undermined when funds that are earmarked for schools and supplies are embezzled or where equal and free access to primary and secondary education depends on the payment of a bribe. Or in some cases where teachers ask for sexual favors in exchange for better grades. The right to health is violated in circumstances where bribes are demanded in exchange for healthcare services or where poor quality medicines and other goods are supplied to the healthcare system through corrupt procurement systems. The disparate impact of corrupt acts upon vulnerable and marginalized groups, including children, all of whom are particularly dependent on public goods and services, also violates the right to equality and non-discrimination. Moreover, the discriminatory effects of corruption often violate other human rights, such as the right to education and adequate housing. Now, human rights often entails the provision of and availability of public goods and services, such as education and healthcare, infrastructure services and supplies. And as such, I believe public procurement can facilitate states' fulfillment of their human rights obligations. Conversely, as the procurement corruption uh, manifest in government responses to the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated, corruption in the provision of these goods and services may threaten the realization of human rights, including children's rights. Uh, in its concluding observation, on, observations on reports submitted by states parties to the convention, the Committee on the Rights of the Child has often underscored the corrosive impact of corruption on the enjoyment of children's rights, in particular the rights to education and health. In addressing the issue of corruption, the committee has tended to focus on the allocation of resources for the realization of children's rights, although it does on occasion make recommendations that concern specific rights such as rights to education and health or specific issues such as child trafficking issuance of birth certificates and adoption. In this context and in line with uh, the committee's general comment number 19 on public budgeting for the realization of children's rights, the committee has made a connection between corruption and the obligation to use resources efficiently for the realization of children's rights. And thus it has often called upon states to strengthen institutional capacities to combat corruption and to ensure, including through the eradication of corruption in public procurement, that budgets for programs that support the realization of children's rights are fully and efficiently spent. There are several reasons for the committee's focus on the issue of allocation of resources. 
First, under Article 4 of the Convention, state parties have an obligation to undertake all appropriate legislative, administrative, and other measures for the implementation of the rights recognized in the Convention, and with particular regard to economic, social, and cultural rights, to undertake such measures to the maximum extent of their available resources and where needed within the framework of international cooperation. The committee's general comment number five makes it very clear that the phrase other measures includes the allocation of financial and human resources. Secondly, the committee acknowledges that state's ability to realize children's rights is to a large extent dependent on the allocation of sufficient budgetary resources to programs that support the realization of children's rights, as well as the efficient use of those resources. Third, the committee recognizes that corruption, particularly procurement corruption, undermines the realization of children's rights by, amongst other things, diverting budgetary resources from programs and sectors supporting the realization of these rights, and by undermining the availability, quality, and accessibility of public goods and services. And with particular regard to economic, social, and cultural rights, by reducing the maximum resources at the disposal of the state. The committee has observed that in some states, funds that are allocated for social investment and the realization of children's rights are often wasted through corruption, particularly in public procurement processes for the supply of goods and services and through the overpricing of related contracts. Accordingly, several of the committee's recommendations focus on the need for states' parties to address procurement corruption. As an example, in 2019, in its concluding observations following its review of Italy, the committee urged the state party to, and I quote, strengthen institutional capacities to effectively detect, investigate, and prosecute corruption and ensure, including through the eradication of corruption in public procurement processes and the overpricing of contracts for the provision of public goods and services, that funds allocated to all programs supporting the realization of children's rights at the national, regional, and local levels are fully and efficiently spent. It made similar recommendations to the Republic of Korea in 2019 and Argentina in 2018. And during the period 2016 to 2019, the committee made a total of 37 recommendations on corruption to a total of 29 states from uh, all regions. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'll just quickly go through, uh, perhaps just uh, end my remarks uh, by sharing some thoughts on future directions of social economic rights education. Uh, I think that the current international context that is characterized by in increased global economic inequality, immense poverty, the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change amongst other challenges affords us an opportunity to reflect on whether the content of current ESCR curricula enables us to produce students who are well positioned to confront existing and emerging obstacles to the realization of social economic rights and in particular, to meaningfully contribute to efforts to address the needs of those that are on the margins of society. I do not think so. And just take the example of the issue of procurement corruption. For our graduates to be able to contribute to effective responses to the COVID-19 pandemic or similar health crisis, and the challenge of corruption in the light of lax emergency procurement processes, they do need to have some understanding of procurement processes. Uh, the increasing instances of sovereign debt crisis, illicit financial outflows, both of which have implications for the ability of states to realize human rights, provide further examples of issues that currently fall outside traditional human rights curricula that I think need to be integrated in human rights education. And this, in my view, cause uh, for what Ignacio rightly called a, a collaborative approach. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Serfas, for your really interesting remarks. And it reminds us all of the really groundbreaking work that the Committee on the Rights of the Child often has been doing on economic, social and cultural rights. And we need to 
um, remove our blinkers um, from focusing always on the Committee on Economic, uh, Social and Cultural Rights. Um, I'd also like to say that I think your uh, remarks are incredibly important. Uh, we need to get outside the field of law, of treaties, of um, constitutions, of, of decisions, and look at some of the more technical economic um, or management uh, decisions which have a huge impact on economic and social rights, uh, including the issue which you've been focusing on, procurement. Um, I, I would like just to add, um, I was very pleasantly surprised earlier this term to discover that our Centre for Accountability and Global Development at the University of Essex had organised a wonderful um, seminar which I was able to attend, um, which involved um, a presentation by His Excellency Professor Kabwana, who's the governor of Makwani County in, in Kenya, who gave a really fascinating presentation on rights-based approaches to budgeting. Um, and a lot of it was his team focusing on, on these issues to do with procurement. Um, so that was really fascinating to see the contributions that can be made um, by, by practitioners, by governments, and so on and so forth. Um, and I found that's a really helpful experience. And these are the sorts of opportunities which um, can be provided through the university to, to students to um, get different perspectives um, on, on work that's being done on economic and social rights. Right, so finally, let me hand the floor to Professor to Dr. Magdalena Sepulveda, who's the Executive Director of the Global Initiative for Economic and Social Rights. Um, and Magdalena is going to speak on economic, social and cultural rights in changing times. Over to you, Magdalena. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to participate at this panel uh, and with wonderful colleagues. Um, I think that my presentation really builds on Ignacio's presentation, but probably because at this moment in time, I have a very pessimistic view about where the world is going. I have made a specific effort to uh, try to see the right side and the positive side, although I, I fully agree with Ignacio that despite the development in, our, in the enjoyment and the realization of ESG rights is huge gaps. So uh, what I'm going to talk today is that we think now that COVID pandemic provide us with an opportunity to change things. But what I'm going to refer is that like in Bob Dylan's song, the times they are a changing, we have seen that if we go back in history, we can see that although ESC right had a late start in terms of their uh, protection, uh, they over the years, over the decades, there has been, uh, there have been evolving, uh, important topics have been considered and, um, and several critical events and factors, uh, but even some uh, specific personalities, many of them academics, many of them NGO representative, grassroots movement, special procedures, have triggered the protection of ESC rights or pu have pushed the protection of ESC rights to another level. But let's look at first to why they have this later start. And I should have started with 1948 and until the 80s. Uh, there was this, this the, the Middle Ages for the protection of ESC rights. And why so? I mean, after the adoption of the Universal Declaration in 1948, the decision was to have only one single document that will encompass a, a, a legal instrument that will encompass as uh, similarly to the Universal Declaration, both categories of rights. However, in 1952, in a decision that was grounded on political and, uh, and ideological reason, we were in the middle of the Cold War, uh, the, the General Assembly in a vote that wasn't even in a consensus vote with several abstention, decided to have two different covenants. And this really marked that the consideration of ESC right as a second category of rights, and we got into what I'm going to call the middle ages of, of ESC rights protection. So basically the two covenants were later uh, adopted in 1966, they entered into force in 1976, but nothing happened. And the first session of the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights only occurred in 1987, 
Um, and this was, was of course, very late. And, and, all, and uh, as all of you know, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights was in, 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 in legal terms, if you want, it's not really a treaty body. It wasn't established in the covenant as the Human Rights Committee. Then we move to the 90s and luckily things start changing. Uh, there has been uh, in the 90s important clarification of the normative content and of course the work of the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights played uh, a leading role in that. Uh, we have general comment number three in the 90s that talks about the nature of obligation that was key to understand these this rights. Um, there was also a very important academic development that I wanted in, in, this, in this audience to highlight, that it was the consolidation of the tripartite typology. This typology that was created by Henry Hsu in the 80s start like moving into uh, inter and human rights, international human rights law expert and start being developing an um, idea, change it to the well-known respect, protect and fulfill framework. And in the 90s, we start understanding the indivisibility of rights and the fact that there, there, there is no uh, difference in the nature of this obligation thanks to this analytical tool that is this tripartite typology. In the 90s, we also have the beginning of the adoption of key international human rights instruments uh, that provide for the protection of human rights, the collective complaint mechanism at the European uh, Social uh, Charter that entered in, into uh, force in 98. In the Americas, it was the, uh, the uh, Protocol of San Salvador in EFC rights that entered into force in 99. And here in this period also, we, we, we have the work of the former Subcommission on Human Rights. Uh, in a period of time in which the, the former Commission of Human Rights was giving almost no attention to ESC rights, luckily we have the Subcommission with experts that provided key reports that helped to understand and push forward ESC rights. And then in the 90s, we, we also start with the uh, beginning or the increased uh, national, justiciabil national justiciability of ESC rights. We, we know that the South African constitution uh, adopted in 96 and entered into force in 97, the Brazil's constitution of 88. I mean, we start having a lot of national, not a lot, but an increased number of domestic jurisdiction. Very interesting that from an academic point of view, at that point in the 90s, we only knew about those in English, unfortunately. And this talk about the way in which uh, rights are learned. Uh, and why? Because we, ha we, we knew about the South African uh, Constitutional Court, the Indian Supreme Court, but we knew very little about what was happening in other areas of the world. And uh, only then after important uh, academic contributions and books that started to bring that it was not only in South Africa and India where we had some important domestic jurisdiction uh, protecting ESC rights, but in other parts of the world, like in my own part in Latin America, there was also important steps. Then we, know, we moved to the first decades of the century from 2000 to 2010. Then here things start happening much quicker. There is an increase of instruments aimed at the protection of ESC rights. And here a critical one is the adoption of the optional protocol to the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights in 2008. Treaty monitoring bodies start really protecting the indivisibility of rights. Uh, so it was not only the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, but we see the Convention of the Right of a Child and CEDAW, two treaties that really talk more about the indivisibility of rights were very active. And also here in, in this uh, first decade of the century, we have the contribution of a scholarly writers that are critical. Um, and, and this is critical because it, it seems that in, in this period of time, Philip Austin is not the only one writing about ESC rights. We start knowing more and more and we have new voices, new generations. Uh, we have Ife Nolan, we have Malcolm Langford, Sigrid Scoli, Alicia Yamin, uh, between many others. But we also have, as I mentioned before, important uh, academic books 
like the social uh, rights jurisprudence, emerging trend on justiciability that are covering what is happening around the world with authors coming from different countries and writing of what is happening. So I think that this also was a key moment. I, and another key moment in, during this decade was really the work of UN Special Procedures and the establishment of ESC rights mandate. So while the first thematic special procedure uh, was established in the 80s, it took decades before uh, we started seeing ESC rights mandate. So in 1998, we have the right to education, but suddenly in the year 2000, we started seeing more and more mandate holders on ESC rights. We have the right to food in 2000, housing, health, water and sanitation in 2008, cultural rights in 2009. Most importantly, I would say also is the human rights reform that happened in 2006 with the transformation of the Human Rights Council. And why so? Because for the first time, the appointment of uh, UN Special Procedures became transparent. Uh, it, it was not longer a political process in which uh, the president of the Human Rights Commission will name somebody, but it, we will have a nomination process and some sort of professionalized the um, the special procedure system. Not that before those days, uh, there were not good special rapporteurs, there have always been good special rapporteurs, many of them coming from Essex, like Nigel Rodley, for example, was a, a key figure before. However, in this period, there are more and more um, uh, special rapporteurs that are nominated uh, because they know the topic, they're expert, and NGOs have certain level of uh, participation in, in the names of those who are elected. So uh, Cephas was one of uh, them that was appointed after this period, but we also have Olivia the Shooter, Catherine uh, Albuquerque, and many more that were this process in, in, in which we are uh, naming. I was one of them as well, I, I should mention. And then we also have in this period, in my view, the, the consolidation of the contribution of NGOs. So uh, NGOs have always been critical. The Center for Economic and Social Rights of, uh, of that Ignacio is executive director was created in 93, but also in this period, we're consolidating his work, Pian International, the establishment of the ESC right net in 2003 was also critical. And of course, when Amnesty International started putting ESC rights uh, on the agenda that Ignacio was at that moment also in Amnesty International knew very well those process. But we have with, uh, with um, the period with Irene Khan was the secretary general now a, a much more involvement in ESC rights. Uh, and, and issues of poverty. And I think that that was also a, a great uh, contribution. Then we move to the second decade of 2010, 2020. And I think that here what we see is the sophistication of the debate and the interdisciplinary approach to ESG rights. So, and now we start seeing uh, that the, the, the topics are more complex, it's more interdisciplinary. We see the consolidation of the rights-based approach by UN agencies. What they started is a very cosmetic uh, uh, approach to uh, human rights. Now they start to having policies, UNICEF, ILO, UN Women, critical in this period from 2010 to 2020. And we started seeing key topics uh, and of course, a key catalyzer is, as, as Ignacio mentioned, is the economic crisis in 2008. Because then we see what are these important interconnections between policies. So from this decade, it's a start, we start consolidating the work that austerity measures are violation of rights, that fiscal policies, we start working on fiscal policies and human rights. As a special rapporteur, I started working in 2014 on the topic, uh, supported by many NGOs. And, and at that time, we did an assessment, just to give you an example of when human rights monitoring bodies have talked about fiscal policies. And we found two or three examples. One of them was in a case of Guatemala with uh, Philip Olston. In his 
civil and political right mandate. So I'm going to accelerate. So these things are start uh, changing completely. And now uh, we have several concluding observation of treaty bodies about importance, but moreover, it's, it's normal. We, we're pushing to, towards that. Important issue, unpaid care and domestic work is now considered a human rights issue and is even included in, uh, in the SDGs. And as Sandy mentioned, this, this is a critical point now with, with COVID pandemic uh, and economic reforms and human rights. And now let me to conclude what, what is happening now. I mean, we're going into the third decade, uh, the 2020 to 2030 um, with, uh, with COVID, uh, within COVID pandemic declared more or less in February of this year, what are the cutting edge topics that we can see that is going to be the topics that um, academic uh, institution human rights program should be teaching on? Uh, what are the policies at the global initiative? We consider that one cutting edge topic is the issue of public services and human rights. And I'm going to be very brief to explain things. I think that the pandemic made evident for common people, to, to citizens, the importance of solidarity and the importance of, of public services in the provision of healthcare, but also in the provision of education. The important role that the state has to play to really ensure that everyone has access to uh, public services that are related to the enjoyment of ESC rights. And I think that unfortunately, uh, we are in this crossroad. So on the one hand, we know that that is the way to go, not only to address this pandemic, but the future crisis and the, the environmental crisis that we're living on. But as uh, Ignacio mentioned as well, there is this a strong trend to go to, towards going back to business and usual and the states are really now in order to uh, provide quickly recovery, reducing the regulation, as Stefan mentioned, from procurement to many other areas and uh, trying to push for more private actors in the involvement of uh, uh, services that are related to ESC rights. And I think that that is an area of work that we should work and stop right away in order to ensure that everybody has access. Thank you very much, much, Judy. Thank you so much, Magdalena. Now, I was going to say a few remarks um, just to sort of pull things together about teaching of economic, social and cultural rights at Essex, but I'm going to be very brief because I want to get to some questions. Um, so I arrived studying my LLM at Essex in 1999 and um, I remember very well, maybe Ignacio does as well, that one of our first classes um, at Essex involved a debate uh, between two veritable heavyweights in the international human rights movement. On, in one corner we had Professor Sir Nigel Rodley, who was then UN Special Rapporteur on Torture and was subsequently on the UN's Committee on Human Rights. And in the other corner, we had the champion of economic, social and cultural rights, Paul Hunt, who was then a member of the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and subsequently was appointed as UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health. Um, and they had a debate about the categories of human rights, civil and political versus economic, and social and cultural rights. The debate, it was, you know, they had the luxury of being on the academic stage and they were playful and provocative and they exchanged punches um, about the relative importance of economic, social and cultural rights. Um, but uh, those rights, uh, those, those questions were sort of very deeply ingrained at the time. Were economic, social and cultural rights really human rights? Were they justiciable? Um, and those weren't just questions which were asked by political leaders, as they sometimes still are today, and judges in some jurisdictions. Those were fundamental questions among human rights advocates as well. Um, so this scepticism influenced how economic, social and cultural rights were taught 20 years ago. We learned about and to respond to these very theoretical legal challenges to these rights as fundamental human rights. We were taught to have confidence to promote the rights and get to grips meticulously so with their legal grounding and their contours of content. So we could be the next generation of activists, advocates and academics. We believed in economic, social and cultural rights and we were optimists. Um, and we were 
talk them almost, we, we approach them almost as an ideology and without always questioning their, their, their limits and, and the difficulties. Fast forward to 20 years, we still address these questions in our teaching because even though uh, these questions are less prevalent within the international human rights community, they still persist, particularly, as I said, in governments and uh, among some um, lawyers as well. But the field of economic, social and cultural rights has been fast moving over the last 20 years, as we've heard from our speakers. There's a huge, a very colourful tapestry of different instruments, jurisprudence and interdisciplinary scholarship and debate and um, critical debate as well. And it makes teaching really fun. It makes learning fun and challenging in so many ways. So I just want to identify a few uh, things that I think are characteristic of the way that economic, social and cultural rights teaching has changed in the last 20 years. Firstly, I think the way we teach now is much more interdisciplinary than it was 20 years ago. Um, so we still engage with doctrinal, legal doctrinal approaches um, and also sort of socio-legal perspectives. But we're so lucky now to not only be able to benefit from the incredible scholarship from lawyers, uh, but also from lawyers who approach rights uh, with an interdisciplinary changing, like a couple who've already been mentioned, Alicia Yeaman, who's very prevalent in our um, reading list, and Malcolm Langford as well, as well as um, economists who engage with human rights, people like um, Amartya Sen, um, Arjun Sengupta, and feminist economists like Diane Elson, who's a uh, was a professor at Essex University and Radhika Balakrishnan. Uh, we also increasingly use non-human rights literature, which is really important to understand. Um, so we look at economists, um, we look at the work of anthropologists like Arturo Escobar and, and Jason Hickel, who I've already mentioned, as well as um, sociologists, uh, political thinkers um, and public health experts at the University of Essex, leading commentators like Colin Sampson, Diane Elson, Andrew Fagan, and uh, my new colleague, Professor of uh, Public Health, Anuj Kapilashwami. So our understanding to different disciplinary approaches is very important also to understand the role uh, and the possibilities and the limits of the law as a site for action. As well as teaching in an interdisciplinary where we also uh, have the Human Rights Centre Clinic, which is a fantastic opportunity for students to really get involved um, in working with different human rights organisations and testing out some of these different approaches. So we've had some fairly legal projects on economic, social and cultural rights, but we've also had approaches developing indicators with um, the OHCHR and the Human Rights Institution in Colombia. We've now got a project involving participatory um, research into participatory uh, constitution um, building. Um, so we also, I think, have a much more critical approach to economic, social and cultural rights as we've become more confident about eco asserting economic, social and cultural rights as human rights. Um, so debates have moved forward to more critical approaches, also drawing on broader traditions of critical approaches to international law, including third world approaches and feminist approaches. Um, and we also engage with the skeptics of, about human rights in different fields. And I think that this really helps us to be stronger um, advocates for economic, social and cultural rights, ultimately, as we try and address not just the limitations of the rights, but the limitations of the systems in which they are embedded. Um, thirdly, we're able to draw on a huge range of different examples, which were not there 20 years ago. There was very limited jurisprudence, there was limited NGO work, and now the field is really full of wonderful examples of how economic, social and cultural rights are being claimed in practice. Um, and that makes the field quite exciting, and I think also much more tangible for the students as they, they learn to, to be economic, social and cultural rights experts. Fourthly, I, I just have to finish really by saying that we benefit from amazing students and our students often come to Essex with quite a lot of experience working in, uh, in human rights, but even those who don't always come with brilliant ideas. And I think it's the discussion in the classroom which really moves us from being sort of didactic in our approaches to uh, try to be transformational um, and really uh, encouraging our students to take these issues on and challenge the limits of the academic debate and push forward economic, social and cultural rights in, in, in their future careers. Right, so we have a few minutes for some questions and we do, if, ever, if all the panel would like to turn on their um, cameras and microphones then I will ha have a little bit of time for a couple of Q&A. So we have a really good question from Cla Claudia, which is a question to Ignacio, but actually I might open it up to everybody. 
because I think it's it's a very um I think it's a very sort of perceptive question, which is what, why is COVID a wake up call and not 100 other regressions before it? Are we trying to justify oversleeping and not waking up on time? Um, we also have a question from Luis Felipe um, and he's asking a question about the current stage we are in the UK, particularly in Scotland. And I can't actually see the whole of the question. Hang on, let me see if I can see it. Okay, here we go. Yeah, about the um, incorporation, as a country that's not yet incorporated the ICSCR, how can we ensure that effective incorporation and implementation without political will of changing the country's socioeconomic policy? So I'm going to open with, with those two questions. I think probably that's all, all we're going to have time for, in fact. In fact. So um, I'm going to ask you just to un unmute yourself and speak if you'd like to be the first to do so. Um, just to say, I tried to, I tried to answer Claudio's question in the um, in the Q and A chat and couldn't couldn't find a way to do it, so I've answered it in the in the broader channel. Um, the answer is, of course, I'm not trying to justify oversleeping, and many many people, including yourself, have been alerting to the need for a more systemic approach um, and to the to economic injustice and to the structures sustaining it. I'm not going to read my answer, but uh, I'm, I, I've sketched out there why I think uh, this is a watershed moment and it has much to do with what Sandy said about the um, how the independences have surfaced. You know, the the it's, it's just impossible to ignore because this phenomenon is now global. Everyone in every country is experiencing, witnessing firsthand uh, the, the structural flaws in our system. And, um, and even if you were previously just concerned about health or just concerned about education or just concerned about food security, all these issues are now surfacing simultaneously. And that's what drives us, uh, drives our attention to the structures and the roots. So that's, that's why I think this is a watershed moment. Thanks, uh, Judith. Um, perhaps I could have a bash at Louis Philippe's question about incorporation of ICESCA in Scotland. Um, yeah, I mean, this is sort of quite a complex and multi layered issue that also we in South Africa with dualist legal systems have sort of struggled with, um, you know, um, you know, how to incorporate ICESCA. And despite the, co the progressiveness of the constitution, our constitution also doesn't have certain rights that the covenant recognizes, such as right to work and right to an adequate standard of living, which was addressed in the committee's concluding observations to South Africa. I mean, uh, my approach would be to say that uh, twofold. I mean, the first would be to say that I don't think a copy paste, I mean, the covenant is not legislation. Um, you know, it's high level norms. So I think it's very good to have a domestic campaign that looks at what is the most appropriate and tailored domestic strategy for incorporating the covenant and what is the best way of giving effect to it in legislation and policy and that would require a very contextual analysis, you know, tuned to the particular context. And then just second point quickly is the question that you raised of political will, you know, that's it's not going to happen without some form of mobilization and social movement, which links up to what we've been speaking about very much on this panel. So, you know, really building up a campaign for ESC rights and for bringing them into the domestic sphere and for ensuring that they effective remedies you know if those rights are breached um so yeah that would be my answer on that issue thanks students i can also compliment uh i i, I think that the problem uh with with COVID is uh, or, 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 or with humanity in general, is that we have reached this point in which we have a pandemic like the one we have because of the structural flaws that we have uh, in terms of the protection or, or the historical levels of inequality in which we're living and uh, the world in which we have privatized everything, giving uh, power to the 
I mean, the symmetries of powers is now bigger than ever before because uh, wealth inequality, income inequality, and the power that, that companies have uh, in the political system. Uh, but we're also going into uh, a, a very problematic climate crisis. So I think that if we don't wake up now, it's just going to be way too late. Um, and my second point is to another comment that was made in the, in the chat that is about social movements. Of course, I mean, social movements have been critical for everything. Um, and I should have mentioned that. What I was trying to, to, to speak was to the way in which also, in which, the way in which ESA rights are taught at some programs, or the way in which academics or special procedures NGOs, personalities within NGOs can have, or personalities within human rights treaty monitoring bodies can have an enormous influence in the system. So, uh, and that was kind of my drop of hope to, to the students that if you see yourself in 20 years more, I mean, you can be one of those who are at least struggling to change certain things. Having said that, I have to go back to, to the beginning of Ignacio's presentation. So yeah, but I mean, if we are here, it's because things are not that well in practice. So, but we have to, we have to keep hope and we have to keep the fight. And I think that everybody can make a contribution uh, working from, I mean, within a social movement or within any other areas of work. And with Essex, I think uh, what is beautiful and what you just mentioned, Judith, is that, uh, or, or this idea of the Essex Mafia, is that these 3,000 graduates, in a way, can have an influence. And, and it's beautiful to, in a way, belong to, uh, to a group of people that in many different ways are contributing to that change. We need more, though. Safas, would you like to add anything? No, I have nothing to add. Thank you. I think we need to unfortunately wrap up, don't we, Andrew? Because it's um, after half past five. Um, I think it's quite late for some of you now um, and not so late for some others. Um, I, I would like to hand back to Andrew. I'd also just like to thank so much all the panelists for joining us today. Such interesting presentations um, and they certainly give us um, a lot of food for thought um, as we teach in the classroom. And it's wonderful to welcome you back to Essex. And I'd also like to thank our fantastic um, Human Rights Centre events team, Matt and Sophie and Kat for having done so much work to organise this event and a whole range of other events this week. You've been fantastic. It's been seamless. Andrew. Thank you, Jude. Um, <clears throat> our worry really with organising the events for this week was, was overload. Um, we're all suffering a degree of Zoom fatigue, right? And, and our worry was that we wouldn't, we wouldn't attract people and the people that we attracted would be, would be too exhausted really to engage in the kind of um, debates, incredibly complex and incredibly urgent debates that, that each of our panellists has presented. So um, that wasn't the case. <laughs> we needn't have worried. Um, the sort of the, the passion and the fire that burns in support of human rights is obviously very bright. Uh, I share some of Magdalena's um, pessimism or at least anxieties about the future. That's what it means, I think, to be a human rights defender, really, to not be complacent about, about the future and to not be complacent about the kinds of challenges that we, that we all face. But just finally, I think, for me, because Jude has, has taken the words out of my mouth in terms of um, applauding various people, uh, I think it's really important, actually, we also pay, pay, pay homage to Jude, because Jude has assembled this particular this particular panel today and it's an outstanding and exceptional panel fantastic shop front if you will the university likes to speak of products rather than courses nowadays believe it or not um and <laughs> in that vein that i have no sympathy for whatsoever but nevertheless in that vein wonderful shop front for for the the contribution that essex continues to make to the to the human rights world um, we've run over time thank you thank you to all of you look forward to working with you on various projects uh, as we move forward into, into this complex, challenging post-COVID, I put that in inverted commas, um, world. 
Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Have a, have a fantastic evening and a peaceful weekend. Thank you. Take care.